Welcome back to Fraud Investigation and White Collar Crime. Today we're going to be talking about Chapter 3, which is Accounting Schemes. Now, this chapter is going to be, uh, we're going to touch on accounting schemes. Accounting schemes go so deep that uh, we can never get into it uh, totally in this uh, one chapter format. But uh, if you uh, find from this course that you uh, are really enjoying it, um, I do have a course specifically for accounting schemes that uh, takes the whole semester. So let's uh, buckle up and get ready for uh, accounting schemes on the um, overview. So the learning objectives for this chapter include um, Understand the difference between fraud examination and auditing. Um, you'll be able to define and understand the concept of fraud and list and understand the four basic elements of fraud under common law and what common law really means. You'll be able to recognize and apply the fraud triangle in different cases. Um, and we will uh, do some of those in class where I will um, give you the uh, different scenarios and you'll um, implement the fraud triangle in those uh, different areas. You'll be able to understand and apply the methodology for fraud examination. So we will talk about the fraud theory method and how uh, that gets applied. You'll be able to define and recognize some cash schemes that take place. You'll be able to define and recognize check schemes. You'll be able to define and recognize payroll schemes in a company. You'll be able to define and recognize expense reimbursement schemes. And finally, you'll be able to define and recognize non-cash asset schemes. So you'll notice that several of the uh, slides today will be attributed to uh, Wells 2014. Um, that comes out of Joseph T. Wells' book um, that I have here, basically the Fraud Examination Manual, uh, fourth edition out of 2014. This actually is the book uh, for the other course that I teach on fraud examination. So again, if, uh, if this class piques your interest, then uh, you may want to consider that other course as well. So fraud examination and auditing, what's the difference? Um, the difference is significant. Uh, the timing is significantly different. In fraud examination, it's non-recurring and it's based on some predication. So we had to get some, uh, some uh, information that there was a fraud uh, suspected of going on. In auditing, um, auditing timing, they're conducted on a regular basis, either yearly or every three years or every five years, depending on the operation of the um, underlying company. The presumption is different um, in fraud examination. The, the presumption is uh, proof to support or refute allegations of fraud. And in auditing, it's just professional skepticism. The scope is different as well. Uh, in fraud examination, the um, scope will be to conduct to resolve a specific issue. So uh, that doesn't mean that if we find other issues in the meantime, that those can't get resolved as well. Um, but our goal is to resolve this one issue that, uh, that we've been um, brought in for. In auditing, you're, conducted, uh, you're conducting an examination of the financial data of the operation um, that you're auditing. The objective of each is different. Um, the object objective of fraud examination is to determ determine if fraud has occurred, and if so, by whom. And in auditing, it's to express an opinion on the financial statements or uh, some other related information um, to that specific company. The relationship is different. So fraud examination is actually, those are backwards. Um, fraud examination is adversarial, where auditing is non-adversarial. So I will change those before I upload them to your um, uh, learning management system. And the methodology is different um, in um, Fraud examination, we use the fraud theory approach uh, to methodology. And in auditing, they use uh, they examine um, the available financial data 
um, based on the best information that they have available from the uh, company. So let's start off with the word fraud. What is it? Fraud is um, basically means any crime where the actor intentionally misleads one or more uh, individuals by statement or action resulting in the misappropriation of something of monetary value. So many different parts to the, um, to the uh, definition and we're gonna go through those um, legal elements uh, in the next slide. So the common law criminal elements for fraud. So first of all, common law. Common law is the uh, law that um, was uh, the founding law of the United States um, when we came over from uh, England and, and uh, set up our new, uh, new homeland here in the United States. Um, we brought over what was called common law from England and that common law is where we get our elements of the crime from uh, today. Now, each state has set up their own law, but many of the states have um, a significant amount of common law still left in them. So common law for fraud uh, has four material elements. Um, that's a material false statement. It includes the knowledge that the statement was false when it was uttered. So the actor or the fraudster had to know that um, their statement or actions um, were false. They had to, there has to be a reliance of the victim on the false statement. So the person that they were told or shown to um, had to rely on those, um, that information and that damages resulted uh, from the victim, victim's reliance on the false statement. So those are the four elements of the crime. Now, each one of these, depending if this is gonna be a civil trial or if it's gonna be a criminal trial, have different burdens of proof. The burden of proof in a civil trial is preponderance of the evidence or 50% plus a feather. In a criminal trial, the prosecution has to prove each of these four elements beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's a much greater standard. Let's start right off with the fraud triangle. So the fraud triangle just is a uh, means of visualization for the investigator to understand how fraud actually occurs. And I find this, um, I found this one through uh, radical compliance, and I think it really helps to understand uh, where each of the three rationalization, pressure, and opportunity fit into the uh, mix of fraud. So uh, what happens is generally it starts with pressure. Um, there's usually some pressure on the person uh, who ends up being the fraudster. Um, that comes out of their culture, either um, because of a medical situation in their family, because of a um, any number of things that can cause that uh, pressure, but it's that pressure that starts the uh, starts the ball rolling. Then the uh, fraudster finds opportunity. So there has to be an opportunity for the fraudster to commit the fraud. And those can um, generally be attributed to a lack of control, uh, lack of significant controls within the company, um, assuming that this is a, a person working for the company who's committing the fraud, um, that lack of controls is what presents the opportunity to the fraudster. And then finally, a rationalization. And you see this in almost every single fraud case. The rationalization being that generally the, the fraudster doesn't start off intending to um, to permanently deprive their company of whatever it is that they're stealing. Oftentimes, what they're looking to do is they're looking to meet that pressure that they felt in the beginning. They're trying to satisfy that by using the opportunity that they've seen to uh, procure money, finances, um, goods and services that they can turn into money to relieve whatever that uh, pressure was that they had in the beginning. And so 
a lot of times that rationalization comes down to either um, I'm going to pay this back or it could be, well, I've given this company my whole life and I haven't been rightly compensated for it. So I'm rationalizing that the value that I am to this company is more than what uh, they have uh, provided me. So I'm going to make up for that here. So in the next two slides, we'll talk about the methodology for fraud examination. Um, the methodology, as I said earlier, has to start with predication. And the predication is the totality of the circumstances that would lead a reasonable, professionally trained, prudent individual to believe that a fraud has occurred, is occurring, or will occur. Um, all fr uh, fraud examinations must be based on predication. Without predication, there is no fraud examination. After we receive that predication, then we apply the fraud theory approach. And the fraud theory approach you'll notice is um, includes the scientific method. So what you do is you start with analyzing the available data, create a hypothesis, you test that hypothesis, and then refine and or amend your hypothesis depending on the results. And the idea being that in the end, you will get to the underlying fraudster and the fraud that they committed. So as I said in the beginning, we are going to be going through some uh, different fraud activities that happen within companies. Um, again, this is a um, very quick overview of this type of crime and um, we won't do justice to, uh, to any one of the different crimes. Uh, we will actually go through a single crime um, with the Pednault book, but um, most of the uh, crime where accounting and or company assets are included um, will not get the, um, the time that we need to uh, cover those. So let's just cover them in brief here. Um, larceny is um, any type of uh, theft or absconding with um, cash or other um, things of value. So larceny, we're talking about cash schemes, larceny of cash on hand, larceny from deposit, um, or other cash opportunities um, within the specific company. Fraudulent disbursement schemes uh, fall under two generally, uh, either shell companies or non-accomplice vendor schemes. And uh, shell company being a company set up by the uh, fraudster themselves and or a, an accomplice that they have uh, on the outside of the company. And that person sets up the shell company to receive these fraudulent disbursements. Um, Non-accomplice vendors uh, can be set up in the system so that um, they look like they have ordered uh, stuff from the company and uh, they can be billed. And when, those, um, when that uh, money comes into the company, then the fraudster can take that um, uh, money and no one ever knows the difference except if the vendor ever does an audit and realizes that they never ordered any of this, uh, this stuff. Some skimming uh, cash schemes uh, involve sales and receivables. Um, sales uh, can be done through either unrecorded or understated sales. So an unrecorded sale would be something that comes in as a cash payment. Um, generally, that's going to be done at a uh, retail level at between a, uh, an employee and a customer, and that sale just never gets recorded. So therefore, no one is any of the wiser that a uh, cash um, theft has taken place. Understated sales is generally if there's uh, multiple items involved in the sale, the uh, one or more of those items are left off from the uh, invoice and are then um, the, um, the purchaser receives their items 
and pays for those items, and the difference is pocketed by the fraudster. Receivable skimming, um, this is uh, generally between uh, either a write-off scheme or a lapping scheme. Uh, write-off schemes are bad debt um, receivables, and so they're, um, we chalk something up uh, to the fraudster, we chalk something up to bad debt in the system, even though it's been paid, and then they would, they would uh, take that payment. A lapping scheme is nothing more than the um, uh, time, the time in between a um, item going out and the money being received. And when that money is received, the uh, fraudster can um, uh, take that money, and they would then send out another uh, invoice to the. Uh, client asking for payment and the idea being that there's a time lapse in between and then another one of these gets put uh, gets applied to the uh, first um, item written off and so that lapping just continues and continues until someone catches the person. Refunds are another area where cash schemes can take place. Um, obviously, if the uh, person conducting retail sales has the ability to uh, issue a refund, they can issue refunds to themselves or they can issue refunds to um, uh, accomplices who come through uh, the line or if it's an online order, they can issue uh, refunds to someone's credit card. Um, however, that uh, that looks, those refunds are easy cash schemes that are hard to detect uh, unless you have a very strong inventory. Stolen checks um, or check schemes um, generally fall under stolen checks. Um, this could involve an accomplice at a uh, cash lo cashing location, so a check cashing store uh, or a bank. Forged endorsement. Um, this could be any type of um, opportunity for the um, the fraudster to uh, forge that uh, signature requirement on the check. Um, this can be done through the fraudster opening a fictitious account in a similar name uh, to the uh, payee on the um, account, which would require the altered payee. Um, so the instead of opening up a fictitious account, the um, fraudster would alter the payee on the account to um, whatever bank account um, they're going to put that check into or um, the, uh, the uh, accomplice would put it in uh, whatever checking account they would put that, that into. Um, and then there's also swap check for cash receipts. Um, this is the opportunity for a check to come in and um, replacing cash receipts that have already been received and then those cash receipts go missing. So outside of retail, this is another area that um, that um, fraud schemes really do work within companies, uh, payroll schemes. So these generally fall under a couple of different areas. Uh, ghost employees, um, that's nothing more than a person who doesn't actually work for the company. It could be a real person or it could be a fictitious person. Um, it's a, if it's a fictitious person, um, it's a little easier because you don't have to, um, you don't have the reporting that the uh, real person might require. So um, the fictitious person scheme is a little easier to, to uh, per perpetrate there. Then you have uh, commission schemes. Uh, these also fall under two categories, fictitious sales or altered sales. So obviously a fictitious sale is something that you never actually um, sold. And an altered sale is you are reporting that you sold more than you, you did. And um, so you bill out more than, than you actually sold and you pocket the difference between the 
uh, actual sale and the altered sale price. Some other areas um, that we won't be getting into this semester for payroll schemes include workers' compensation, where uh, the company may um, um, either reduce their workers' compensation by not reporting employee uh, employees on the books, um, or it could involve the employee themselves um, altering their workers' compensation to uh, reduce their um, uh, or increase their take-home pay. Falsified wages, um, this is another area we won't get into. Um, obviously, that's pretty self-explanatory, changing the wage amount that the person is actually owed. Now let's cover some expense reimbursement schemes. Um, I've picked out four here, uh, mis mischaracterized expenses, the fraudster characterized, uh, characterizes as an acceptable expense, something that uh, is not acceptable. And generally, uh, this is going to be something like uh, alcohol at a, uh, on a food bill, uh, the company may not reimburse for alcohol, so they mischaracterize what that uh, purchase was. That is a, um, an expense reimbursement scheme. Overstated expenses, uh, this would include altered receipts um, or overpurchasing. And what that means is that um, the receipts that for what the uh, employee actually purchased are altered to reveal uh, either something different that is, again, not a um, not what was actually purchased, or it just increased the value of what was purchased so that the uh, employee gets back a greater expense than they actually had for outgoing uh, money for that. Uh, Overpurchasing is another means of um, overstating expenses. They could uh, overpurchase something uh, which means that they paid more for it than what they are. They report that they paid more for it than what they actually did. And that's another uh, overstated expense. Fictitious expenses is a completely made up expense based on fake supporting documents. So with um, the way that we have the ability to, to uh, make up invoices, um, you can make up say, uh, fake sales receipts, uh, very easily. These fictitious expenses are something that an employee can submit. Um, generally, it's going to be a legit, a, an item that is expensable. So the person is entitled to uh, get reimbursement if they actually purchased uh, this item. But in this case, they didn't actually purchase it. They just said that they purchased it and made up a fake uh, sales receipt. Uh, multiple reimbursements. This is not seen as much. Um, this is when an employee seeks reimbursement multiple times for the same expenses. And the reason it's not seen that much is because it's very hard to keep this type of a scheme going. You pretty much would have to, to continue to do this forever while you're at that company to um, make it um, so that it wouldn't be detected. Otherwise, you're going to get caught with um, submitting the same thing multiple times um, very quickly. Now we'll talk some non-cash asset schemes. So this could be misuse or borrow, borrowed or stolen um, um, assets of the company. So it could be tools. It could be um, Whatever the company does uh, for sales, it could be uh, whatever that product is. Um, it's, it's any number of things that is either borrowed or stolen from the company by an employee. Um, larceny is non uh, larceny non-concealed means that the person is just walking out with the uh, item. So people may or may not um, be um, suspicious. So for instance, if you uh, regularly take your computer home to home from work, uh, but it's a work computer, um, that is 
a recognized um, thing in most companies that you're allowed to do. But if you don't bring that back, or if you um, report it stolen at work, then you've gotten into the uh, misappropriation um, of non-cash assets. Um, asset requisitions and transfers. Um, this is using the internal company mechanisms to obtain assets of the company for illegal purposes. So if I um, requisitioned uh, something that I said I was going to need to complete the sale of, of a product to a, to a vendor, um, if that actually happens, um, but there is no actual sale to a, to a vendor, then that is an asset um, requisition that was done fraudulently. Then you have purchasing and receiving schemes. Purchasing and receiving schemes um, are assets legitimately ordered by the company and then misappropriated by the fraudster. So they intercept that uh, from the vendor to the company. Um, and then there also can be straight out fraudulent shipments. So like I said, most of um, today's information came out of uh, Joseph Wells books, Principles of Fraud Examination uh, by Wiley and Sons. Um, that is the textbook that I use in the uh, fraud examination course. And uh, the other reference that I used today was radical compliance for the uh, uh, fraud triangle. So thanks for uh, watching and uh, look forward to the uh, next episode.